set of nine videotapes provides an opportunity to share in a unique experience where Stafford Beer introduces an audience to the world of managerial cybernetics. The event took place over five days in July 1994 at the Falkendale Hotel near Lampeter in Mid Wales. It was organised by the Liverpool Business School at John Moores University, where Stafford is Honorary Professor in Organisational Transformation and a Senior Fellow. The aim was to provide a video learning resource by recording discussions between Stafford and an audience that had little or no previous knowledge of the subject. Over the course of the event, Stafford explains the development of the subject from the initial scientific discovery of cybernetics. Through his own development of managerial cybernetics, he introduces the tools and models that he has created to offer an alternative approach to conventional management practice. The resulting material embraces the key principles and models that have previously been introduced in his 13 books and referred to in many of his published papers. This is the first learning resource where all these have been brought together in one integrated way. Managerial cybernetics continues to be the only available scientific and coherent account of effective managerial practice. Stafford provides numerous anecdotes, applications and insights from the perspective of practitioner, manager and scientist. Feature the use of low variety solutions to high variety situations and reinforce an earlier point that solutions can reinforce failure through reductionist thinking. No one solved the exercise in what, so a document called The Explanation is handed out, which introduces the concept of the black box that can be used to overcome the problem of not seeing the wood for the trees. The concepts of intrinsic control and homeostat are introduced with illustrations and examples. Stafford encourages the audience to examine the nature of viability systems and discussions cover a company, hospital, the church, a small holding, a wave and a parliament. The ability of a system to be self-sustaining and maintain its identity is teased out. And Stafford's concept of recursive systems is illustrated in terms of the individual, the university and the church. Session 4 begins with a discussion of examples of requisite variety taken from the morning's newspaper articles. Examples include terrorism, the police, fighting inflation, newspapers with declining readership, conflict in Rwanda, a British rail strike. These ideas form the foundation for examining viable system modelling in the next session. You're looking for requisite variety now, you know what you're after. A bit more sense today than it did yesterday. Mm. What did you find, Glenn? Uh, a few articles. Uh, the, the Israeli, um, the Israeli bombing in London, a big one. We were talking about all the security measures they've done on mm. the uh, Ken Kensington Gardens Road, or whatever. Yeah. The road that's blocked up from both ends. They have security cameras. They have patrols. They have all sorts of things. 
and yet still they managed to mm. float, <laughs> float the embassy. So. Certainly lecture in requisite variety, isn't it? I mean, how the hell do you actually contain it? You, did you all talk about that one? No. But I assume somebody would pick that up. You see, if you ask yourself now with your embryonic cybernetic knowledge, take the airport situation. I played a game with myself, I, I hasten to say, before I marched off to jail, where I would say, for years and years and years, I, I said, I have put sticks of dynamite in that tin. And nobody ever opened it. <laughs> it wasn't, of course. <laughs> Cigars in those days. And, you know, it is a matter of requisite variety, isn't it? So, if you really sat down and said, well, how could I more or less guarantee as a cybernetician that this cartload of people on an aeroplane would get there all right. You probably have to strip them all, do a body search, give them a cotton robe and put them in the plane and take all their luggage and clothes and belongings in another plane, wouldn't you? I don't really see that, that anything less is going to, to guarantee it. So all you can do is diminish the, uh, the risk. You all heard the famous story about the, the man who wouldn't travel on an aeroplane because of the risk of bombs? Well, he wouldn't. And he was always late for the international board meetings because he was always going to the, the appointed city and by train and bus and God knows what, and he was always late. And one day he arrived on time and they said, Well, George, good to see you. What happened? And he said, Oh, well, I'm travelling in a plane now. And they said, Oh, you changed your mind. And he said, well, yes, I saw a statistical assessment. There was one chance in a million of anybody having a bomb on an aeroplane. So the chances of two people having a bomb are a million squared. So I carry a bomb with me. <laughs> so I think that that is a wonderful example, and I'm glad somebody picked it up, because it really is a serious a serious issue and trying to get the requisite variety now the whole business of policing is of the same kind because uh, the the see the ideal just think for a minute about the the ideal forget what makes sense if you had a policeman for every citizen who was watching everything you did and said cut that out that's section three of or Look, uh, the other role of the police is look after you. There's duck, she's coming at you with an axe, you know. Um, then obviously you would be able to do it, but you can't. Now, when I last studied this for the Home Office, I found that there were uh, 500 times as many people as there are policemen. So what are you going to do about that? The fact that you've got that disparity. Now, there's, there are answers to this. What do you think? What, what do you do? Eliminate the ones that you know aren't going to cause. Well, that's a good start, but that's a very fascist kind of answer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I'm asking you to tell me is, um, what, what can you do to help the police in this circumstance? Well, things like neighbourhood watch. Neighbourhood watch is an endorsement of the police, that's good. What else? Small communities. Yeah. Like, so, the interconnections of everyone. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's a good article on that with Bayswater Farm. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, Bayswater Broad. Uh, yeah. Uh, where the, um, they've set up their own self help group. Mm. Crime's gone down. That's purely, purely mm. technical Well, this is community stuff. What, what can you do for the police? What have we done for the police? Well, the law. The law, of yeah. course, yes. Hello, hello, hello stuff, yes. But uh, go on, you're not getting near the technology yet. You equip them. You equip them, yeah, exactly. But what do you equip them with? Telephones. Telephones, yeah, but the crooks have telephones as well. Fast cars, now we're getting there. There was a new great radio on Tomorrow's World or something where it's set up on a frequency that people can't listen in on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and encoded or something. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure exactly the technology. But now they were trying that, I think it's in Yorkshire somewhere, where right. the police have these, the, their communications all 
encoded so that people can't listen in um, to know, like, if they're robbing and somebody says the police are going right. to turn up or something, so they uh -huh. scan for it, they won't know. Well, it. there's our American voice. Now, what's the big difference in this equipment in America it's between like guns? guns. Yeah. Exactly, you see. Well, indeed, but it's a, I think that the debate about arming the police get, achieves a lot more clarity and sanity if you realize that what you're doing is amplifying the variety of the, this one in 500 ratio of the policemen. I mean, it's, it, 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 this is a much more profound way of looking at it than to say, I don't like people walking around with guns, you know, or I do like people walking around. It's, it's, that's all froth on the surface. The real thing is how are you matching your police ability to police with the disparity of the numbers. That's pure requisite variety. Yeah, the worry with the arming side is that if you arm the police, then crooks are more and more going to arm themselves. So mm -hmm. you may have amplified your ability, but then mm. you've reduced your, mm. the, uh, or increased your variety. Exactly, Glenn. You see, I mean, these arguments are quite familiar. What I'm suggesting to you that's different about this conversation now is that you base it in this understanding of of Ashby's law, the law of requisite variety. And it, well, let's leave terrorism. What else have we picked up today? The independence is, it lost 90% of its uh, market share last, from the same time last year. And they are bringing a new editor. Is that a low variety solution to a high variety problem? I would have thought so. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends how good he is. You see, if he can project himself big enough, but it sounds to me like a low variety. I mean, I like that phrase, low variety solution to a high variety problem, yeah. No, I, the, the buzz is the independent's going to crash, isn't it? What else have you spotted? By um, trying to control inflation with interest rates. <laughs> oh, yeah. the, the whole reason why they're trying to control inflation and what have you, it seems like a, a variety mm. solution to a, a very complex... It certainly is. I've had many arguments with economists about the nature of inflation because, see, it seems to me that from a non-cybernetic point of view that they regard inflation as a fire-breathing dragon who's stalking up and down the streets and has to be shot or dealt with in some way. Whereas I see inflation from a system's point of view as essentially a measure of the extent to which the poor are getting better off than the rich. <laughs> you think about that. Because you see the rich are losing value because of inflation. And somebody with no money couldn't care less about inflation, obviously. Have you got nothing? Who cares? <laughs> So that's a very really different insight. I was, I was nearly hung from a lamppost in Oxford about 30 years ago for saying this. <laughs> and Oxford being a, a really strong, a real stronghold of economists. Oh, I don't think so. Oh, right. hmm. If you've got 10 quid and something now costs 9 quid and it costs 8 quid, you've got quid less than your pocket. Well, this is true, but if you've got nothing... Yeah, but nobody's got nothing, actually. Well, they're very close to it, you see. So, if you're very close to having nothing and somebody gives you a handout in the, in the social system, gives you ten pounds, because you've got nothing, you instantly spend it to, to get something to eat. So, so the, the inflationary effect is going to be minimal on you. But if I've got a million pounds in the bank and this is just going down like this... That's as long as your social payments go with inflation. Well, they do roughly, don't yeah. they? Yeah. They're supposed to. If you take the parameter of the system a bit further out, knock on effects, oh, I'm not going to think that wasn't a tech or not. Just be careful, that's all, Dave. But the knock on effects of high inflation mm. is uh, detrimental to the, to the growth of business, which means you're going to not generate wealth as easily. Well, they're, they're alleged to be, you see, but... Uh, I mean, I, I believe that you would have a lot of fun really thinking about this in cybernetic terms, which I've always done, because I've watched the progress. I've worked a great deal, I think you may know, in the third world. It's 
especially South America and India. And, and I have watched the effect of the policies of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which are based on these beliefs. And I believe that they're beliefs. They're not substantiated. Anyway, that's a huge subject. We'd better get back to how we're supposed to be wrapping up the newspapers here. Any more? Yeah, Rwanda. 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 Yeah. That's right. And you can't address them all, can you? You know. Well, no, the, the man the street, the man in 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 the street. One of the awful things about those situations, from my observation, is that it is never mentioned, is that people settle personal scores. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too bad, he's dead, you know. <laughs> it's a rather wicked thought. It's just like unpopular officers get killed in war. What a bad, what, too bad, you know, what a pity. Let's hope nobody finds the bullets in the back. <laughs> I was wondering if anybody would mention the rail strike itself, you see. I mean, we're right in the middle of it. It's, it's the same thing. Which might actually save the railways in the future. <laughs> 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 yeah, from the point of view of requisite variety, though, you see, I mean, you, you, again, you're, you're trying to manage a railway through a few parameters, whereas the real social reality is much, much higher variety than that. And, uh,. What I'm trying to get across to you is that people manage variety by making models which are low variety so that they can handle the thing. This is nowhere more evident than the, the problem about parents and children, you know. You make this model of your, your offspring and uh, the offspring is never like that to start with but then proceeds to grow up <laughs> and uh, changes everything. Well, we better get on. It's, uh, I've, I've really, we're beginning to get to the stage where you have to do some work here, you see. I mean, I, it's no use me just uh, just lecturing you. Hi, Are you blown up, Kate? <laughs> oh, is that all? Yeah, that's good. So, uh, the next thing is, has anybody burned this bottle of wine that was on offer? No. You lazy crew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you uh, the next instalment of this thing, which is called uh, The Explanation. Now, I want to introduce two new um, things in this session. Uh, one is the notion of a black box. Now, you've heard of a black box, but I'm not talking about the one on aeroplanes, you know. It's a much more general idea. What, what do you think is meant by a black box in cybernetics? So an input and an output. Oh. Really That's it. Now. Yeah, you buy that? Yeah. That's exactly it. Now, you see, there's one way of, under, of, of understanding terrible messes in terms of variety. That you look at the mess and you say, my God, what can I do with this? But if you say, well, never mind what's going on inside the black box. These are the inputs. These are the outputs. Then you can begin to see how it's related. And that's exactly what this puzzle does. I mean, it's put in such a way, uh, Kate read it out for us mellifluously last night, uh, it's put in such a way as to make you feel, oh my God, <laughs> what the hell is all this about? Well, actually, it's very simple if you think, um, if you accept that this activity is a black box. Now, you're told to do that because it says you, there's an investigation going on with the personnel department. You're not allowed to monkey with the inside of the black box. So what are the inputs? Right. And what are the outputs? Distant, right. So this is about the simplest problem you can have, and this is the reason I've, I've given you this thing. It's, 
it's far from being very difficult, which is what I try to con you into believing. It's utterly simple because you have this black box and you have two inputs and two outputs, each of which has only two states. It couldn't be much easier. But of course, <laughs> I'm trying to, to tell you that in real life we don't see the wood for the trees, you know. <laughs> And one of, the, one of the system's tricks is, is to do that. Now, I will hand out to you, uh, having saved my bottle of wine, uh, I will hand out to you this thing called the explanation, where I look at the number of alternatives. How many do you think it is? How many possible arrangements are there of, of t you see it, two in, two out, each with two states? Ain't so, folks. You've got to get used to this problem of variety generation. It's, it's much more difficult than it looks. You see, what a black box does is raise the variety to the, of the output to the power of the input. So, so you, you've got this and this, like the 2 to the 42 yesterday. Huh? And it's murder, and and it, in fact, it's um, well. I go through it here, and I won't bore you with it in this session. But it, the answer is four to the four. What's four to the four, anybody? It's two hundred and fifty-six. So you see, in order to solve this problem. You, you have got a setup, a black box, and you've got 256 possible states. Now, I, I have tried also, I mean rather wickedly, I suppose, to, to generate some ang anguish and anxiety in you about what the devil you do about measuring variety, right? Did I succeed? <laughs> Good. <laughs> now, we're beginning to grapple with it here, you see. Actually, among all this mess, you have to find one out of 256 states and then you can deal with it. So, please take that away at the end of this session or today and, and try and solve it now because you've got all the clues that you're going to get, Glenn. <laughs> that the wine is out. Maybe half a beer. <laughs> So there are more lessons to come out of that study. I, I'm rather pleased with that study, and I, th I think it'd give you a feel for a lot of things. Now then, so, black box uh, we've dealt with. The, the other word I need before we proceed is the, the word homeostasis. Does anybody know that word? You know, I'm, I really am, folks, very carefully defining the technical terms I want. And I'm quite aware that sometimes my vocabulary runs away with me and I say, <laughs> like the frisson business, please stop me and, and say, what the devil does that mean if you don't understand? No, don't be shy about that. But the words we need, I will define. Homeostasis, what is it? Uh, homeostasis, the thing that does it is the homeostat. Now, what's the word that you all know, which is a particular example of a homeostat. The end is the same. Pardon? Thermostat, exactly. And that is a particular example of a homeostat. And it's thermostat, therm being the Greek for, for heat. So there you, there you are. We're going to try and control the temperature. Now, on this question of how you are to grapple with all this as a manager, for instance, we, we immediately notice here some very odd thing. What is the temperature of your body? Depends whether you're English or American. They say, quote, I'm just dying to see what you would say. <laughs> Americans, for some reason, they have a different figure. Anyway, it's much the same, isn't it? Now, the, the interesting thing is, you see, if you... We, we, we're dealing here with a, a sort of engineering term, a, a thermostat, you know, we have one attached to the radiator. Now, 
I've never heard of a surgeon who's found a thermostat in the human body. There isn't one. That's is very extraordinary when you think about it because our temperature is very, very well controlled. And what's more, we can, we can walk onto a, onto a melting shop stage in a steel, uh, you know, where, where the melting temperature of iron is 1300 degrees for heaven's sake, and then go into a refrigerator in the butchers, and somehow it works. And there isn't a thermostat. So how does, how does this happen? Anybody want to comment on that? Do you remember? Do you remember, Jane? Yesterday, I used the word intrinsic control when I was talking about the prison governor and the what steam governor and the sleeve going up and down. Now, obviously, our bodies have an intrinsic control device which is not isolatable because nobody's ever found it. So the definition of a homeostat that I want you to remember, I really do want you to remember this, is that it is a mechanism that holds a critical variable. Now that could be anything. In the case of the thermostat it's heat. So it holds a critical variable within physiological limits. And that is the key to the definition. Because it's your body that determines this. By all God, God knows how complicated piece of machinery. But the problem is, you see, if you get too hot, you're gonna die. And if you get too cold, you're gonna die. And the criterion is obviously something that's settled by your body. So our normal ways of looking at this are no good to us at all because we're not going to find it. But we do note that, that you can go all from these extremes of hot and cold and so on, and if you're healthy, you're not ill, uh, you are going to retain this, uh, this nice even temperature. It's amazing, really. Now, as I said, it's not just temperature huge number of things in the body are homeostatically controlled. Give me another example. Blood pressure, Blood pressure certainly. The pupils of the eyes, I'm sorry? The of the eyes, yes, but that's more, uh, th that we do understand, don't we? Because there's a direct feedback circuit which depends on the intensity of light which, which causes that to happen. So I would prefer not to use this powerful notion of homeostasis to describe that. I would prefer to call that a stimulus response mechanism. Hunger Sorry? Hunger. Hunger and thirst indeed, yes. One very, very obvious one that nobody's come up with. Breathing. Breathing was the one I was after. Who said that? <laughs> yes, Jane. Um, Yes, I mean, we managed to go on breathing at a, an enormous rate, and it all happens, and we sitting here talking, and, and somehow it works. So, so things like, now that's an oxygen balance we're after here, obviously, isn't it? That's why you're breathing. Uh, so we are homeostatically controlling the oxygen balance, and um, the one, uh, the thing about Lee's example that's, that's, very, very pinpointable, I would say, when he said thirst, is the balance of water, the balance of fluids in the body. You know, get dehydrated, kaput. So, we have this extraordinary mechanism, the homeostat, and the huge contribution that Ashby made to cybernetics was to understand homeostasis. And his book, Design for a Brain, is really all about how homeostats work and he develops mathematical ways of looking at that and so on and so forth and he built a machine called a homeostat to investigate this. Now I, I may have mentioned earlier that all, all of us in the early days kept building machines. I told you about Great Walter's Tortoise. We all built machines to try and understand things, you know, ludicrous machines and, and Ashby's homeostat was a set of magnets 
<laughs> and, uh, and pointers which all triggered each other off, you see. It, 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 it's amazing how much variety you can generate like that. One of the early cyberneticians went into a uh, corner store, as they're called in the States, and, and found a sack full of magnetic compasses for kids. They're little round things with a needle there that point north, very roughly, of course, because these things are about 10 cents each. He bought the whole sack, <laughs> much to the surprise of the shopkeeper, I imagine, and he made an array of a hundred by a hundred or whatever it was I don't think it was quite as big as that that would be 10,000 wouldn't it yeah too big um, 10 by 10 would be a hundred but it was bigger than that and there they all sitting all roughly pointing in the same direction you see and they waved a magnet across it and watched the results and it took hours and hours to settle down again depending on how the magnet was waved now, this is more like a model of the economy than this crap, excuse the word, about, uh, <laughs> about controlling the interest rates, you know. You get sort of waves floating around the, sy the system which produce oscillations, we would say. Hmm. So I really wanted you to get the hang of homeostasis because that is, the, that is, as it were, nature's way of dealing with this high variety situation. The reason we can't deal with terrorism is because that isn't built into nature. We're not supposed to have terrorists, but now we've got them. Too bad. <clears throat> now, uh, have you ever thought about praise and predators, speaking of nature? Because there you've got a fairly elaborate homeostatic system that's fairly easy to understand in its effects, though not, of course, in a great deal of detail, but it, it, it makes a very nice example of what we're discussing. You've got a population of foxes and a population of rabbits. What happens? The foxes eat the rabbits, yeah. Then what happens? Sorry? Right. That's right, Lindsay. You eat all... <laughs> right. You got it, you see? It's a perfect homeostat. Because you can't afford to wipe out either population, either the rabbits because they're being eaten, or the foxes because they're being starved, and somehow or another, this levels out. Now, nature is full of this stuff. And we go around teaching biology, and most of it's incredibly boring, and we're surrounded by this fascinating stuff that nobody has the key into discussing, because they're not cyberneticians, I feel. Good. <laughs> why, di why didn't you define homeostasis for me? Right, oh, well now, you see, we're trying to get into those biological realities. Let, let me give you another example. You know what a cabbage aphis is? The little green fly, you see, so it sort of sits on the cabbage and munches and leaves a hole. Well, this thing, I don't know what it weighs. It's a trifling amount. <laughs> now, you take one cabbage aphis and an... Uh, an endless supply of cabbage and no predators which is what we were talking about what weight of aphides would you have at the end of the season you only have to start with one these poor little devils are hermaphroditic they don't have a sex life poor dares so so you've got one and lots of cabbage and no interference what's the weight that you would end up with at the end of the season have a guess is 822 million tons. Yeah. Now that's dramatic. You, you think you've got a problem with terrorists? <laughs> you see? I mean, why aren't we up there in aphides or caterpillars or something? Because of this interlocking homeostats. Now the fox rabbit one is, is very simple for purposes of illustration. And what you've actually got, of course, is a whole set of interacting networks that is, defies analysis. But boy, does it ever give you a respect for the way nature operates. It's just extraordinary. 
And uh, I so often wonder about the exploding human population. You s well, indeed. What happened to the Aztecs, Jane? Yeah. They, um, <laughs> ate, they climbed too much of their um, um, fields and whatever. And in the end, they started because they'd over... Yeah, well, you see, we're getting into catastrophe theory here and things like that. We, where a system that's working very cleverly and is in balance gets pushed over the edge for some reason. Now, if, if you were hit by a comet, which is what I think happened to the dinosaurs, that, that really doesn't count as a systemic effect, unless you're thinking really cosmically. <laughs> but uh, the idea that uh, uh, a comet or uh, a meteor uh, smashed into the Pacific Ocean as it now is, creating a dust cloud which blotted out the sun would account for writing off the dinosaurs. But that's not the sort of thing I'm talking about. The sort of thing I'm talking about is the growth curve, which looks like a flattened S. In mathematical terms, it's a logistic. And somehow, all these complex systems level that off. So, uh, we, have, we should have more respect for these kind of things. And okay, now, what we are going to do is to use all these ideas that I've been trying to boil up inside you to consider the question of a viable system. Now, this is very special terminology. What is a viable system? What's it mean? <laughs> Sustains, yeah, good. Anything more exact than that? Controls itself. Right, well, well, yes. Where's the word come from? I mean, it's Latin, and then Latin means verbal, yeah. But um, how has it got into our language? It, it, it belongs to a very special discipline. Have you ever heard of obstetrics? When is a fetus viable? When it can sustain itself. Right, exactly that, which is well before birth, of course. Hence the possibility of caesareans and so on. So the notion is precisely that, that you've got a system which is self-sustaining independently of its origin, in, in the case of the fetus, obviously, of, of its mother, but otherwise independently now this is a very difficult concept to get hold of and i want you to i want to level with you about this because if you if you overreact and say it must be totally independent you see you're going to define something which doesn't exist because nothing's totally independent i've always been very affected by uh, the uh, principle of the German philosopher Hegel. Have you ever come across Hegel? Yeah. Oh, you would have done, yes. I, Marx pinched all his ideas from Hegel, you see, in the first place. The whole notion of dialectical materialism is, in Marx comes from the Hegelian dialectic, which says we have here a thesis, we have an antithesis, and we have a higher synthesis. Now that is a very good cybernetic concept. And what I was going to say that Hegel, Hegel was the first glimmer of a systems thinker, really, in modern philosophy. I'm talking about the last couple of hundred years. He had a thing which he called the axiom of internal relations, which I'd ask you just to contemplate for a minute, which says that the terms by which, sorry, the relations by which terms are related are an integral part of the terms they relate. Yeah. Yes, I will. <laughs> the, the relations by which terms are related are an integral part of the terms they relate. And what this means is that a mouse is smaller than an elephant or it wouldn't be a mouse. You know, the, 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 the whole nomenclature breaks down if these things are not maintained. And of course, once you get that clear, you observe that everything we discuss is related to everything else. You also observe that 
the names of things are very important because we are using language all the time. So we, we like to think we're accounting for things that are going on in nature, but what we're really accounting for is a linguistic model of that, which is kind of hair-raisingly frightening, actually, if you, if you think about it too long in the middle of the night. <laughs> So, a viable system must be capable of independent existence, but don't overdo it. Now, <laughs> you see, if some idiot came in with a huge hoover and stuck it through the ceiling and sucked all the oxygen out, we'd all be dead. Are we viable systems? Somebody comes through that door, points a gun at me and shoots me. I'm supposed to be a viable system. Why didn't I survive it? <laughs> see, now you... There are obviously, like, like when we said that defining the boundaries of a system is immensely difficult, defining the boundaries of viability is immensely difficult. You have to decide what is to be allowed to count, in other words. You could say that if a bullet entered me, if I were really viable, the hole should close up, as it does if you put a bullet through the tank of a Spitfire, you know. Uh, it, it's lined with ex expanding rubber stuff and the hole shuts because the, the uh, gasoline expands the stuff inside and it shuts the hole, a very clever trick. And you could say, well, if we were really viable, we would do that. And I dare say in the course of the next couple of thousand million years or whatever, we would develop that characteristic if all of us were continuing getting shot, if we could do it in time. And that's called evolution for you, if you like. So, approach this thing with gentleness, please. A viable system. Now, give me an example of a viable system. Apart from yourself, we've established that. Tides. Hmm? Tides. I'm sorry, the tide coming in. Ah, I wouldn't call that a viable system. Now, why wouldn't I? Hmm, that's a very interesting question, Lee. I'm not sure. Well, that is, uh, it's a bit like the, the answer to that other question which um, Paddy asked um, about the iris. It, 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 that is a, a fairly simply analysed response system based on, uh, sorry, I should be looking at Lee, based on the gravitational pulls and so on. And I'm not really looking at that as a viable system. I'm looking at something which is... Um, uniquely identifiable and sustains itself. Small holding. Small holding, yes. Yes, okay. Pardon? Computer. Computer. Now, that is an interesting one. How does it sustain itself if you don't plug it in? Well, that's what I'm saying. Ah, <laughs> you were saying right. <laughs> if you have certain conditions. That's like it. Like we've got yeah. air, right. That's fair it's enough. It's a very things. interesting question, this, isn't it? Because uh, it, it, that's fascinating because uh, it's an artifact, that's why it's fascinating. So, does it fulfill the conditions or not? Let's try and store that one up and let's revert to it when you've got the whole model on board and we'll see what we think. Yeah? Now, let's get on with the, the more obvious examples, please. Who, who knows the Great Ormond Street Hospital? What's it for? What's it for? What's Sick children, yeah. How long has it been there? A very, very long time. So, you see, we have an entity called a hospital for sick children that has outlasted, which is, I think, quite interesting, all its staff, all its patients, is still there and it somehow cycles through its staff and its patients and maintains maintains what is the point what does it maintain it's 
identity is the word, yes. So a viable system has an identity, and that's one of the problems that I was having with the tides, you see, that, that it is a, an identifiable thing that we're talking about, which can sustain itself. And if it eventually dies, as we shall, in what sense does, does that survive? What are the two answers to that, folks? When you're dead, in what sense do you survive? There are two answers to it, obviously. I should have said, obviously. <laughs> oh, that's the third, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, well, that's part of a bigger homeostasis, isn't it? Yeah. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking of either of those, although they're perfectly legitimate answers. Yes. Well, that's part of the memory, isn't it? Don't put that all together. Pardon? That's the one I was after, you see. We have developed this machinery of self-reproduction, which, uh, which means you're surviving in that sense. And the other answer I was after was what? Yes, not everybody accepts that. But you see, you may go to heaven or the other place or whatever. Maybe you survive in that sense. And uh, why have people always tried to find out whether they did survive, you see? It's very interesting, isn't it? I'm certainly not offering a position on this in this meeting. <laughs> but I want you to see what, what the options are around here. So this is what we're after, a viable system. Now, I, I, I floated a company, and, and uh, Glenn's resistant to that, but... Um, Again, you see, you've got a company, take Harrods, for example, has been around longer than all its clients and all its staff. So as... Um, well, my, my company has been around for 80 years. I can still lots, but it's still there and it's thriving. Well, okay. It must be viable. That's right. That's the sort of test to use. So, now, do you remember when we started off you were with Alana trying to identify things you would like to study. Now, which of these are now emerging as viable systems? Would you reckon? Do you remember the discussions? It was only yesterday. <laughs> I wasn't even there, but I have spies. I'll set the manufacturing came up. Schools. Schools. Well, now, schools are interesting, aren't they? How long, well, uh, universities, how long has Oxford been now? Mm, thousand. thousand. Yeah, so it's said. Well, that's certainly outlived its staff. Most, the church is a wonderful example. I mean, how that remains viable is, is, is a study in itself, isn't it? Very, very interesting. And how it handles variety in the process, you notice. Pardon? Tolerance. Don't, don't leave the church for a minute. I thought you were going to say something explosive, Kate. I would expect you to. Yeah? What is this huge mechanism the church has used to control variety by not allowing women to have a voice in the whole thing? And don't blame that on Jesus. Blame it on St. Paul. But that's what's happened. And if you've got this patriarchal masculine organization now I hope I'm not really offending anybody because I'm only saying what is fairly obvious and you might still go on with you know, your uh, attachment to a church but it's, it's just as well to see what's going on here from a cybernetic standpoint and I've, I've written quite a lot about that hmm so the, these are our viable structures. Now, what I want to ask you is this. Uh, the reason I did that exercise through Elena yesterday morning, I would, I, I will eventually get round to this, you probably <laughs> abandoned hope by now, of, of showing you what I call the viable system model. And this is a way of looking at this organization. And I have to give you all this all this introductory stuff because we need words like homeostasis words like variety and so on now what I would like you to do to maximize the 
the effect, effectiveness of, uh, of your stay here is, is to choose out of the various options. We've had manufacturing, we had schools, there were others. I would like you to choose four or five and subdivide yourselves into four or five groups. Well, there's only 13 of you, so um, probably four's enough. That's about three and a bit. I don't care if it's only two, but don't go below two, because otherwise you'll go off and... Uh... <laughs> Pardon? Uh, well, one is a group, you see, mathematically speaking, but that's not advisable socially. So, <laughs> so I believe. So, uh, what I, seriously, what I would like you to do is make a few groups and say, well, uh, now, I mean, Lindsay, for instance, might feel that, uh, where is Lindsay? Gosh, <laughs> you escaped from my ken for a minute. You might feel either that she wants to do schools because she knows all about it or that that's the last thing she wants to do and she should therefore choose. But I think school is an obvious one because we all... What am I looking for? I'm looking for something we all understand. You see, it's not much, much use uh, modelling uh, the, the uh, Ku Klux Klan or something unless we have somebody here who really knows how it all works. Um, so, uh, we all know how school works, more or less. <laughs> we all know how, or think we know how a manufacturing industry works. That's the simple example, simplest example of industry, because you're actually making things, and we can talk about that. Well, let's pick on those two, and then pick another couple, and would you discuss this among yourselves in the break time, and, and try and come up with a coherent structure to this group that's going to look at this, then I can talk and I can bring in all those points as we talk when we know what it's about. Because I would like you to go away with an actual model, a, a viable system model of something and something you have chosen to study. Uh, otherwise it's all a bit vacuous. Mm -hmm. You, you want to look at the structure of those organisations, how they... Absolutely, but I'm going to lead you in how to do that. I mean, that's what, that's what the viable system model is. But if we know in advance that you're going to be interested, I suspect, in manufacturing, and you, I suspect, are going to be interested in schools, maybe not. C could you please, in the break, come up with a grouping so that we can begin to structure ourselves a bit? Do you want each group to choose one organisation? Well, or two if you feel bad about it, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm totally open here. I just, I just want to know, to, to help the explanation of the model, a few po a, a foci which would enable us to pinpoint some points. Assuming I know anything about it, but I... <laughs> Well, four organisations four or five and two or three or four in the group and so on try and try and break the thing up and let, let's get make them all different you know I saw that Amnesty International was one of the things and that uh, I mean I don't think anybody would be here if they weren't interested in the human predicament so maybe that's one which is a bit different from so I, I want different ones well, you see one of the things I've my, my job is to convince you is that the cybernetic approach to a viable system works for wh wherever you apply it. It certainly applies to the body because that's where it started. It started with a mathematical model of the human nervous system that I made many, many years ago. And see, the, the point is, are there, are there, to use a word, laws in, in nature which condition and guarantee and so on viability that was the thing I started out with and uh, with great respect to to the biology you see I I never found an answer in biology and that's where you'd expect to find it but you don't you might expect to find it in medicine and you certainly don't because medicine is absolutely reductionist and I don't know if you you folks have ever found yourself in the position of being treated by four different specialisms and they don't interact 
I have just received, I'm, I'm what is euphemistically known as a senior in Canada, which means an old age pensioner in English. Now, I've just received a letter from the Minister of Health in Ontario, which says, 25% of admissions to hospital in Ontario are due, uh, uh, of seniors, 25% of senior admissions to hospital are due to mixed up medication. That's unbelievable. I, yeah. Because one doctor said, you take this, my love, and you'll be okay. And the other doctor has said, and you get on this rack and I'll stretch you and whatever they've done. And the mix up. So the government of Ontario, which is very, very sophisticated and advanced, I may say, has, has put in a system through the pharmacists, which we call chemists, hmm? um, so they're all on a computer network to try and catch this poor old buffer when, when he goes in there. You see, you've got it as well in England. That's right. I t you're right, Dave. I did see something about that. Yeah, but look, where, where's he got us? You know, I mean, this is crazy that... What an indictment of medicine, and everybody says, oh, aren't we clever, we can catch this out. How did it ever arise in the first place? If you've ever read anything about Chinese medicine, for instance, it couldn't possibly happen because you're treating the whole person. So, again, we find this holism, reductionism dichotomy is very, very serious in our, in our society, it really is. Hmm. Now, before we close this session, I really do want you to come up with better, uh, uh, more fulfilling conversation about what isn't, what isn't a viable system. I mean, we started mentioning some viable systems on the grounds that they survive. What isn't, for instance? Uh, you know, n not any old organization is a viable system. Try and think of one that isn't. <laughs> that is Claire, I, isn't it? I've got, I really have to get this right or I'll never survive uh, my own self-esteem. Self Claire, of course it's a viable system. They are trying to stop it being a viable system by the minute as far as I can see. But it has been there for years and let's hope it stays there. But. Uh, you keep chopping lines off and you make it unviable at some point, don't you? It's a viable system as long as it has money pumped in to support it. The money doesn't come from affairs. So in, in one respect, it isn't a viable system. If they privatise it, it's going to struggle to be a viable system. Oh. They're not going to have that money pumped in. I don't think they'll have a hope. Now, where's this money coming from, you see? Well, take it easy here. I mean... Um, Where do the roads come from? The roads and the cars and all this stuff that Thatcher so liked is being paid for from the public purse in a concealed fashion. And if you start looking as transport as a viable system, you see that, that bumps it up a bit. We started with British Rail, now we talk about transport as a viable system, there are various bits to it. So what is the payoff between roads and rail? And as soon as you start thinking about this, you have revelations, honestly, because I, re I remember uh, working for the uh, Ministry of Transport in the 60s, and they said, well, why don't people leave their cars at home and catch the train? Now, this is the kind of symbolistic nonsense you get into. They don't leave them at home because they've got the car. They have made the investment in the car that instantly alters the perception of where the payoffs are. Because once you've got the car, you, you, it doesn't cost you anything to go and sit in it. It's going to cost you for petrol, but that's nothing compared with the rail fare. So the, the things are immensely complicated, you see, and people, people will insist on treating it as if it weren't. Now, we have stumbled here on, on the final thing I actually hope would come out of this conversation, and it's just emerging. Why did we go 
from rail to the transport system. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? After all, we people would still have to be transported if all the trains mysteriously disappeared, wouldn't they? So is that why it works? Yeah. Of the right. The working... Sorry. The working on uh, a theory with the, the transport that uh, they're going to build more people have got more cars, they're gonna carry on getting more cars, so let's build more more roads. Mm. Public transport's basically taking a back seat because everyone wants total convenience. Right. What they're doing is reducing the rail network so that you've got less was. opportunity, mm. less convenience. I thought they were really that really looked at that and trying to do that. Change change every year. Second it's a bit late, you see, because the transport lobby is entrenched and the railways are being undermined. Uh, aircraft are in there with all sorts of other constraints on them. So the notion of a transport system is more than the collection of the bits of transport, is what I'm getting at. What is the same argument when you get to energy? Coal, gas, electricity, nuclear. Where is the energy policy? We haven't got one, never had one. Now, what I'm getting at is, is a, the, the last word I wanted to put into this thing. I'm, I, I do try and ration the words. We've had black box, we've had homeostasis. The last word is recursion. Now, I have a law, never mind old Ashby, <laughs> which says that all viable systems contain and are contained in viable systems. Now, we started with you as an individual. What viable system are you contained in, Paddy? Um, I don't know, say part of me is in a uh, viable system that is the university, say. Or so you're a student in a university. Yeah, so. so that's the next level of recursion. You see what I mean? Yeah. But what else are you? Family. Family. That's another level of recursion. Distant, di distinct. I mean, not one in contained in the other. You are contained in the in the university. You are contained in the family. Do you belong to a church? Maybe you don't want to say. If you did, you would belong in the church. Next level of recursion, right? If you belong to a political party. Mm -hmm. So you suddenly get this extraordinary image of of the viable system called you. At the center is something like a sphere where your organs are part of you and you're part of the family and something else is part of you and you're part of the church and so on and it, you, you, hundreds of them you see that's why i call it a sphere i think it's a nice model it's, it's amazing really when you start thinking about it and this linear causal chain that i was attacking yesterday you see makes you pretend you're not that complicated because they say oh it's just me you know and I've signed on or what have you done it's very boring but the, this rich thing like this sphere with no boundaries out here sort of shimmering away that is you we get you know it's a purely simple scientific thing I said and we're almost into mysticism because there's no limit to this you're the center of the universe and and everything else is bits and pieces of the viable systems of which you partake. Isn't that exciting? Now, oddly enough, you see, this is exactly what Buddhism teaches, by the way. <laughs> and that's not a church, so I can say, say that. Not really. It's a philosophy rather than a, a church. Well, we ought to wrap up now, so don't forget Black boxes, homeostasis, recursion is the clue. Now, when we resume, uh, we will actually assault the viable system head on. Okay? Have a nice break. <laughs> yes, good question.